walk into a funeral parlor or a corn How you guys doing? Good. Good. Excellent. That's what I wanted to hear. So, my name is Carlos. I'm going to be talking about SCADA systems, ICS stuff. I'm going to attack team this presentation with my buddy um, Eric over there in the back. So, we're just having some fun. We're going to review some information up here. This presso is pretty much on basic level. So, we're going to scratch the surface on this stuff as quick as possible, but I'm going to try to give you some actual information on what the landscape of SCADA security and ICS security is around these uh, times, right? For all times, most of this stuff is easy to understand from a conceptual um, side, but once you get deep into what ICS and SCADA is, then you're going to get to see that there are more things in here that need a little bit more of knowledge, a little bit more research, and a little bit more understanding on your side, right? So, disclaimer, ideas this presentation are mine, they're not my employers. I am not by any means an expert. I really want I really want to learn about this stuff, so I'm always listening to people, I'm always reading, I'm only always getting more info on myself. So pretty much when someone comes up to you and says they're just an expert in this stuff, try to do a lot more research than those guys, right? The presentation does not disclose any, you know, pro, uh, appropriate, um, uh, proprietary information or anything that's totally on, on a secret basis. And I'm not trying to bail anything to kill people or, you know, destroy the human race. So we're good to go with that. So the war against the machine. We all know how this one ended up, right? It was an awful, awful as the Bears game last week. It was real bad because they took over the stuff that we had already been using, the stuff that we identified, the stuff that we built a long time ago. And ultimately, they just came in here and they took it because it was so damn insecure. Most of the stuff was already in there and was our productive uh, infrastructure. And because of the stuff that we failed to recognize once we started working with this, that's how the machines took over. So how did this happen? First, they came for our assembly plants, our, our car assembly plants. But I wasn't a car assembly guy, so I didn't speak out. Then they came out for our water supplies. But I had a well in my house, so I didn't speak out. Then they came over for our energy generation stuff. But I had solar panels at home, and I didn't speak out. And then you know what happened? They came for the booze, man. <laughs> And then I went on the la la on these guys. Come and get it. So, what are we going to do here? Let's define SCADA, typical components of our network, the protocols, the topologies, and let's go over the lessons learned, all right? Pretty much what we're going to do here. So, the terms SCADA and ICS, they're used very, very interchangeably, right? So, let's pretty much jot it down to a point in which we understand what both are. And we'll take it from there. First of all, what is SCADA? Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Systems. All right? This stuff, if, this is a great talk, by the way, on DEF CON by James Harlan. He pretty much sets up a lot of concepts, and I took this one to, to give it to you guys right here. These are highly distributed systems that are used when you need a whole bunch of math to happen. You plug this stuff into a hunting server that allows you to do all this math and control a lot of machines. Right? That's pretty much what it is. It's a little bit of supervision on a very, very broad level, and it's actually a small component, right? And a lot of data acquisition. You keep acquiring data to do that supervision, but the data is the one that allows you to do this stuff. Okay? Examples of this stuff: the power grid, a nuclear power plant, a distillery, a whiskey distillery, a brewery. It's even like that. Why? Because we got components that alter temperature, pressure, and some other stuff on an industrial process. You need to keep that in, in, um, in uh, within certain parameters, right? So SCADA helps you do that. Now, what is ICS? Industrial control systems. Industrial control systems are more of process, isolated processes that form act an actual chain of events. You start doing something, then you, you pass something out to another machine, and so on until a product is finished. But you don't need to keep that much of control over the whole thing, except for the, 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 just the, uh, the frequency in which you apply that process to those parts. That's how you define both systems. Now, what are the typical components on one of these things? How did the machines got so good at churning out all these, you know, terminators and all these things that are going to destroy it, right? First of all, 
there are two basic components for classification. System assets and system operations. System assets, you might think of this stuff as the software, right? Most of the, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, the physical stuff. These are the robots that start welding, that start doing, that start, you know, um, start or stop a process, uh, control point, all that kind of stuff. The underlying infrastructure in this is the system operations phase. System operations is a certain la a layer of programming or software that keeps this thing on control. It's the one thing that orders a certain component to do something, change temperature, to activate a motor, stuff like that. That's pretty much what it is. These are the basic components on uh, an industrial system. Now, let's talk about system assets. This is the stuff that makes it happen, like I said. First of all, PLCs. Who's heard of PLCs here? PLCs are basically just stuff that control a machine on a very basic level, on the most frontal part with the architecture for, uh, for industrial control. Now, remote terminal units. The remote terminal units are pretty much like PLCs, but you're gonna see them in spaces which are remote, very widespread in terms of geographical distances. They control stuff that's way far, um, sorry, far away from the, um, the main industrial component, right? But they have a very, very um, similar function to what a PLC is. Now, for IEDs, an IED, not a bomb, an IED is a component that allows you to control something, keep it within certain parameters. It's a very specialized component. Where can we find IEDs? We can find them in a nuclear power plant, to control certain temperatures, or control pressures, or control certain voltages on the power grid. The power grid is actually full of those, uh, those things. And they, like for instance, on, on power plants, they allow you to keep certain frequencies or certain voltages in, in a big system. Now, for HMIs, HMIs are actually the ones that are most prevalent in the entire infrastructure, the ones that you can actually see. It looks, most of the times, look like a tablet, right? It's a component that is switched, it's uh, hooked up to a machine where you can start controlling or seeing how that machine or that component is doing. HMIs are pretty much, uh, pretty much um, prevalent on these environments, but they can also be manipulated if you actually get to those things. Now, how do they look like? This is, a, this is the most basic form of appeal. It's actually a small component that you can see them out there on the, on the shop floors that are, are connected to these machines, right? Now, the remote terminal units, as you can see, this is a, a transformer way out there in the, uh, the woods. And this thing's pretty much monitoring what this, what this transformer is doing and sending data back through the backbone to the main um, substation. An IED pretty much looks like an, a PLC with a little more of a graphical interface, but this one is the one that's hooked up to the machine or the component, monitoring those parameters. And the HMI, if you work in, in manufacturing, you've seen this way too many times in the shop. This is pretty much the graphical form of process that you can use to control, and in this case, stop, right? How should it work? First of all, if you guys ever took um, basic design for, uh, for, uh, for um, electrical components, I'm not um, a manufacturing major, but I had to understand this stuff six months ago when I first saw one of these processes. When you talk about ladder logic, this is pretty much what's inside those components, right? Is, this is the information that a component needs to follow in order to get something to work or something to stop, right? These conditions and operators start working once they are switched on or off depending on their nature, right? So in this in this uh, in this process, which is pretty much a um, cache terminator, the only cache two things, very specialized equipment, it allows you to start controlling certain things. Is it Tuesday right now? No. Okay. So in this case, energy is going to start flowing out here, and then it takes into consideration a lot of variables, right? And if they do happen or not happen, that's when the flow of information or the flow of energy stops along the way until certain conditions are met, and boom, you get a decision point, which energizes or de-energizes depending on what the situation is. To read to understand, these are two great uh, links and resources that I found, actually to understand this stuff if you are not 
a manufacturing major or you know a systems engineering major helps you out a lot just to understand what the logic itself is. Supervision and analysis assets. These things are set up in the network so that you can have a more graphical view of what's going on on the shop floor, right? The supervisory workstation are just that, are big computers that you give to someone who's monitoring the process in which you can see the entire thing unfold before your eyes, right? But the main thing in here is that these things act on read-only mode most of the times. Obviously, the stuff like stuff, the stuff like this is not always in a certain state and it can be altered. If you can manipulate the code, you can get these things to act in write mode instead of read mo uh, read, uh, read only mode, and that's when the whole thing unleashes. The data historian is also very, very important. This is a database that collects a lot of information about what's going on in the shop floor. Why? First of all, it gives you logging capabilities, it logs a lot of events, and since it collects a lot of information, you can hook this up to an analysis system and it will tell you statistics about how certain processes are doing. If they are performing way over what they're supposed to do, under what they're supposed to do, or if they pretty much um, steady in, itself, in, the, in themselves. Now, all this stuff needs a little bit of communication, right? And this is what, where things start getting a little bit uh, complicated. because. They are uh, protocols, they work like the protocols that we use every day, but they're a little bit different. They're a little bit different. You got two types of protocols. Field bus, which, is, which are the protocols that control the communication between the most basic components, the machines in the floor shop, and their, the first line of supervisory controls. And then you got the back end stuff, and those things control the communication between big systems for SCADA and industry control. Let's think about field bus as more of a LAN type of communication and the backend stuff a little bit more like the WAN communication between one and two autonomous systems. So for purposes of this presentation, what I want you to understand is the two basic protocols for field bus are Modbus and DNP3. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about this stuff in a minute. For backend, you got OPC and ICCP. Both of these protocols are the sign handle the long haul of information between two sites. First of all, I'm going to do a comparison between Modbus and DNP3 from the security standpoint. I know that some of you guys might know way more than I do about the basic of this stuff, but I want you to be aware of what the dangers are in the current state, right? Modbus initially, it's a very rudimentary protocol, right? It was supposed to be doing really simple stuff. So if we look at this from the, uh, the security, with the security glass on it, what do we get? There is no authentication, right? There's no encryption, which means the stuff is pretty much sent out there in the clear. There's no cycle anonymity check, so we don't have any means to actually check the integrity of the data that's being sent out. There is no broadcast suppression. What does that mean? Denial of service, immediate denial of service. Thank you very much. File transfer. It's not enabled on this one, so it means that pretty much you can change stuff from the from our from remote perspective. But let's look at the MP3. The MP3 does not support an authentication or encryption in its most basic form. But if you implement another um, implementation, I'm sorry, another version of this stuff, which is called Secure DMP3, then you do have these um, this important components. Put them in yellow because they're not native this for It does support CRC, which means you can check for integrity. It doesn't support broadcast uh, suppression, which means we still have the ghost of now service in our environment. And it does support file transfer. For means of us being able to change something in the field remotely, that's perfect. But for purposes of security, if we do not control this, it means we can alter processes remotely. We can, up, we can upload information to the network and change the processes. Now, let's get on to uh, the backhaul. For OPC, OPC is full of that stuff. This is really scary from the standpoint of how we implement this. 
OPC makes extensive use of VCOM and RPC. What does that mean? That the way that we manipulate information remotely between two computers is not so secure, right? The way that a computer can access something else in, in a remote location and make use of those files, open up those files, modify that information is awful, <coughs> right? The use of Metasploit, fire and forget. If you actually play with Metasploit, you've got a whole bunch of modules you can preload, you can just fire them whenever you want. And they've been lurking around for years. So it means that you need to do a lot of work to patch this stuff up. What else we got? Depends on Windows off, on client and the server. So this can be compromised if you're using an old or a form of authentication. The, and the, this, this, the, this thing uses a common account to work for the entire system, right? One common account for an entire system. So what does that mean? If one account is compromised, only one account, I don't need two or three, you just need one. If one account is actually compromised, the whole thing's gone. If posts are not hardened, if you do not have control on what you're opening up or what you're not catching, that stuff is open to whatever they want to do. Depend Once again, it depends on legacy off. Because most of these systems were set up a long time ago without you guys knowing. So, Land Manager in Windows 2000 Auth is extremely rudimentary. You can extract a lot of credentials from those systems with a blink of an eye. RPC vulnerabilities, like I said, they use um, the first um, first resource and they're linked to the Metasploit um, capabilities. And this is, this is awesome. You can, you can actually create an OPC server in your network if an attacker actually can create it, and it can take over in a man-in-the-middle type of attack. And you can set it up and you can tell the network to do whatever you want, as long as this server pretty much authenticates with the rest of the network. For ICCP, we got a different flavor of stuff. There's no authentication at all. No seven. That's it. Potential surveillance and injection of information because of the fact that there is no authentication at all. Now this thing, the core of ICCP is something that is very akin to an ACL, an access control list. And whenever you have an access control list in a system, what is the first thing that it's susceptible at or for? Anybody know? Spoofing in any type. If you define a certain set of conditions, you can easily spoof those conditions to go somewhere else. Uh, since it's a WAN protocol, it traverses open systems. So it's very easy to sniff, extremely easy to sniff. You get interaction with unwanted or poorly configured clients, and you know, heaven forbid, you all you got those things connected to a WAN. Depends on, on isolation of hosts to avoid um, unwanted communication. So it means that certain systems might not be as connected as you want them to be. You need to be. Um, very, very diligent in terms of how you want those clients to communicate, and that forces you to establish secondary and um, uh, compensating controls. And need some extensive use of, like I said, compensating controls. And it forces you to be more creative on what is it that you're going to do to establish defense in depth so that you have more options to fall back in terms of security. Now, what do we get for the lay of the land? How is a normal, well, let's say a standard ICS or control system um, built? This is the boundary right here. This is the boundary between the management network and the productive network, right? So, so I'm sorry. What I want you to see is that, first of all, if you lack segregation or isolation, this stuff is definitely going to get out of control. Segregation in this in this uh, case means that you provide a very granular le a granular level of interaction between two systems using a network component like a switch. Isolation means that they cannot uh, connect or talk to them at the same time. They're completely separate. A device that does not belong to an industrial network is always a platform for an attack, whatever it is. If it, if it has TCP um, uh, capabilities and the rest of the network does as well, it's fair game. And many times you may get to see the business to um, ask you to link those two networks because they need, need, they need some sort of oversight, right? So once you do that, you need to start thinking about those possibilities on how you're going to be able to still secure this network 
while allowing that communication. It can happen with a single HMI or an historian. Like I said, those things are fair game because they use software to connect to that network. They use protocols that are the same as the ones they use in the industrial network. They're placed outside, they're gone. The principle, who has, who has heard about this? The least privilege and least, well, least privilege, I think most of us, right? What about least route? Anybody heard about that concept? It's pretty much the, the network version of least privilege. You establish the least amount of connections needed for a host to do its job. Kind of like the same thing, but when it comes to connections, it, it's going to give you a little bit more work because you need to start thinking about how those rules are set in the firewall. What are the relationships between these devices over here and the rest of the network? So if I set the least amount of network connections, let's say for this manufacturing cluster, I assure that only certain things that need, seen, that need to be seen on this module are given to the rest of the network, including the administrative piece. Domains for logging, this is very important. Let's say that this network is set up on a Windows network. You got a domain so you can authenticate. How would you do it? Do you use the same domain as your corporate network? No, thank you very much. Why not? Because it, it, it could give an attacker complete control. Exactly. Once one account is compromised, they can get into both parts of the system. And, and further, the traditional Active Directory controller is outside on the corporate LAN. And how do people break into a network? They go in. So you want to make sure that the Active Directory controller that you're using is inside of that control network. One, thank you very much. One, that it's inside of that network and it's segregated. Yeah. Number two, that that separation allows you to do more tracking of the, the logging activity on that piece of the network, on that part of the network, I'm sorry. That's the reason why we want to segregate domains for logging into those pieces of the network. Remote taxes, oh my god, this is, this is something I've been working for the last three months. Remote taxes to this stuff. Head honcho number one tells you, I want to have full control and access of every gizmo that I assemble in that line. Jesus Christ. How do you do that? You can get as creative as you want with your architecture of the system. You can do two-factor authentication, sandboxing certain connections. You can do. There are a lot of commercial off-the-shelf products that can you can implement on this stuff. But that is not the solution. That's not the only solution. You need to think about those measures, and then you need to think about how you're going to implement it in a kind of like in a, in a special relationship with this system. And of course. Denial of service. Because of the, the, the vulnerabilities that we already talked about in the system, you need to think about denial of service and how you're going to do broadcast contention with all these nice TCP IP components. So, what did we learn? Yes, there is no faith in what we made for ourselves. And what does that mean? That when you think about the current vulnerabilities of the system and how your ICS or SCADA network are going to evolve there are things that you can do, right? As long as you know what the system is like at the present time and where your company is going, that's pretty much how you make your own fate when you implement this stuff. Get to know the system. Get to know your products. How many of you guys work in manufacturing? Listen to this one. How many of you guys here in the audience work in manufacturing and have never set foot on the shop? Raise your hand. Good. That's awesome. Because it means that all of you guys have been on the shop, you know the processes, you know the engineers, you know how they think. Since they are not security and they are not IT, they might have a very different view of what the network is and what it's supposed to be doing. But if you understand how the things that you do for a living are made in the shop, that gives you an awesome edge on all this stuff. Because for instance, Maybe if you, you split out the, the, the processes for making a certain thing, right? Let's say that you thought that one of those components was the most critical. And it turns out it's, it's the most simple. And you, and, and you set your sights on securing that thing. You know what you just did? Like they say in my country, the broth just became more expensive, I'm sorry, more, more expensive than the meatballs. You focus on something that was completely, completely cheap to, uh, to understand or to avoid.
and you left the most basic stuff out, the most important stuff out. What changed? And I want you to focus on this. When I see as we're manipulating machines, we're manipulating processes, right? We integrated the physical realm into security, whether we liked it or not. The basic triad used to be, yeah, no problem, CIA, man. As long as the data is confidential, it's, uh, it's integer and it's available to people, no problem. We got it covered. Not anymore. The triad just became square. There's a new dimension that we added here, which is safety. And I'm going to thank my brother Bradford Hacker at, at IOActi for this concept. Was actually um, thought about it in, a, in the middle of a DEF CON party a couple months ago. What happened here? It's not enough to think about these three. We also need to think about the safety of our equipment and most important, our people. Because now you're manipulating things that can hurt someone. Look at this. We got these lessons from the technological and business side. Like I said, this stuff is built for efficiency. It's built to churn out more components, right? Not to be secure. But it's our, it's our job to actually understand this from that perspective. It's going to depend on very insecure and many very unstable technologies. Some people are going to have a very poor network design here because they didn't understand the system, or just because of the fact that it was set up a long time ago when we didn't have to think about this. The lack of separation between church and state, right? The lack of separation between business and engineering. Um, there's no change control. If you don't have a change control board and you let anyone do whatever they want, you're on your own. That's a very bad thing. Because you need to integrate operations and IT and think about what you're going to do when you start working with your ICS or Scott and Edwards. If you can't harden a server, it might hurt you a lot in the future. Because you're enabling someone to do, you're giving them your own weapons. You're, like, you're enabling them to do stuff you're not supposed to be doing in your network. Um, the fact that the information is set up and declared, that's also a very, very um, dangerous thing. Um, wireless related stuff that I can think of, when someone starts thinking, you know, we need to start uh, putting stuff on wireless like, you know, like readers or like uh, control workstations and stuff like that inside of the shop, uh, the shop, the floor, um, the shop floor, this stuff is great. Because it allows you to run around. Have you ever been into like a really big engineering plant? Those things are huge. You're gonna have to run a lot in order to get something read or um, or compares, and you need quickness on this stuff, right? So if you hook it up to a to a wireless network, what kind of vulnerabilities or what kind of um, inefficiencies is that gonna uh, introduce from the network perspective, from the security perspective? Um, proprietary technology. Most of this stuff, most of this, the, uh, the manufacturing piece, Scott ICS, is dependent on a manufacturer, right? Well, I only play with um, Alan Bradley, or I, I only do Rockwell, or I only do uh, Johnson Controls, and then they get their own stuff. Just to give you an example of the many providers, right? How do you get those things to play along with each other? It takes resources, it takes time. Denial of service. How do you control the fact that your plant is always operational from that side? How do you combat this very, very harmful condition in the network? And then on the business side. And this is the first thing that we need to understand. You know the, the three religions on security? You know, any, anybody know about the three religions? <laughs> ISACA, ICS Square, and SANS. And the three of them, you know about that. <laughs> the three of them was the first thing, well at least um, Isaac could tell you that. The first and foremost thing on anything you do in security, human life. And it's kind of like an exam thing, have you ever taken out an Isaac exam and you see human life, oh man, they tip you off. It's always, always direct threat to human life or safety. Before that, obviously then we go with the separation between church and state. That's first and foremost. Let them do whatever it is that they do, and if there is a need for them to talk, do it as secure as possible. 
No knowledge of the infrastructure when business doesn't even know what's on the floor shop or what's in the network. They start building things that are not um, supportable by you guys. No risk awareness. If they ask for something and they do not think about the risk, um, the risk um, footprint, then we need to start thinking about that stuff for them. And we can tell them how much it's going to cost. Um, no knowledge of industrial processes, like I said. Get out there on the, on, the, on the shop floor and ask them questions. What about this process? What about this product? How do we do it? How are you enabling um, automation? How are you enabling more efficiency? Are you doing this securely? Is it relying on services? Downtime, downtime, downtime. What is the main purpose of a manufacturing plant? Anybody? Manufacture and make money. Excuse me? Manufacture and make money. Production. And production. Those two. If you cannot churn out more products to sell more, that's always going to be a problem. And if your solutions don't allow for that, you're in the wrong spot. Try to think about this on how security can actually cut you that time in half. It's possible. But it takes a lot of time. It takes understanding the process. The disconnect between plant personnel and business and IT. Kind of like a pretty much a triad that needs to work on themselves. Can someone steal your trade secrets on this? Absolutely. We just saw that there are problems with authentication, that there are problems with encryption, with surveillance. Of course they can. So that should always be on the back of your head. How can I keep this stuff from someone else to do it? And right at the end, corporate sabotage, which is pretty much the same thing. You cannot keep that productive capabilities and the lack of funding. But we always want more money to do our stuff. Build a business case. Build your um, capabilities and how what you want to do and present them to the upper management in money, in monetary terms. They want to know how much it's going to cost and how much they can save or how much they can do. But it's always good to do a business case when you talk to the business so you can show them you understand. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, these, most of my stuff came out from this book over here by Eric Knapp and Joel Thomas Langell. That's obviously on Amazon, you can get it. That's an excellent book, how to talk about SCADA and ICS. He's a great guy for this stuff. And this one is more, more technical, but the University of Calgary in Canada, they've been focusing on petrochemical engineering for a long time. So they got a lot of knowledge on, on ICS SCADA stuff from, from, the, from the petroleum industry. And technical papers, this, this stuff by SANS, it's got a lot of basic information that you can read in a very, um, in a very easy way. I would definitely tell you that you need to download that stuff. Last bit of knowledge. This is from the cult. Time hustles those who wait to die. If you do not get off your chair, go out there and look at what things are. If you wait for this stuff to happen, it will happen. Trust me. It's all about you guys feeding time, getting out there, get to know your processes, get to know your network and you start doing things that help you with something. But that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. We have one question over here. Chris. Do you find that uh, safety helps drive uh, the business to accept security and find security? Absolutely. In terms of, there should be a safety um, engineer or a safety liaison in the plan. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the areas that most people take for granted at least in security, and we never reach out to those guys. So there's, there should always be, I think, it's, I think it's by law, there should be an industrial safety officer. Mm -hmm. And you can always reach out to those guys and say, you know what, I know certain things that you should be looking at, and get those guys in there. Because it doesn't, it not just helps you understand this from, from the conceptual side of what safety is, it also helps you strengthen your business cases once you go back to the big guys and tell, this is the reason why we need that. Excellent question. Anybody else? Excellent. So I'm just going to team, uh, tag team this with Eric. If you guys have more questions about this one, when Eric's done, both of, uh, both, uh, both of us are going to be out here um, uh, answering your stuff. So, awesome. Thank you very much.